Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Zia. I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in transgender care. Welcome to my channel and welcome to our Monday's q and A's. This is a place where I answer your direct and specific questions as long as they're not diagnostic in nature. Um, I can go ahead and answer them. So feel free to email me your questions. And if you wonder if I can answer them, don't worry. If it's not something I can, I will email you back and let you know. Um, you can email them to info at drzphd.com. Um, Having said that, as always, there's timestamps below for the questions. And as always, I've selected six random questions from the Q&A folder in the orders that they have been received. And I'm really excited to go over these questions. Looks like the one and two is quite long, so bear with me, but I will project them on a screen. And as always, I blocked out everybody's names uh, for uh, confidentiality reasons. So um, let's get started. Question number one. Love your work and everything you do for us. My question is about breaking free from overcompensating behavior. I can already tell this is going to be a great question. I'm a non-binary trans feminine, trans femme in midlife who is recovering from a recent separation from my seven-year marriage. I'm sorry to hear that. My trans identity didn't fully click until a year ago. So I felt strongly connected to women and femininity since my teens. I'm pre most things, but I'll be starting mild HRT later this year. My wife didn't take the news well, despite being queer herself. She, she says she wants the best for me, but now she's turned off and doesn't want to talk about any of it. It hurts to be rejected this way, but what's more upsetting is that she has taken to vilify me for projecting false narrative of toxic masculinity onto me which triggers intense gender dysphoria since I've usually errant on the side of being too gentle and permissive, and I'm not even very masculine. I'm sorry to hear that. She has a lot of unresolved trauma and trust issues from her past, which I hope would have improved with my support. But instead, they grew exponentially worse towards the end, when at her worst, she accused others of cruel thoughts, actions, or intentions without any justification or basis, in present day reality and considers being triggered by another person in my way to, in any way to be an act of malice. I don't think she consciously means any harm, but when her self protectiveness spirals out of control, it's hard not to be affected by it. I know who I am and have many people in my life who know that I could never have been the abusive husband she's now making me out to be. But I've had to ask myself, why am I drawn towards wounded women, romantically and as friends? And why do I give them so much leeway before protecting myself when I've had much better boundaries around men in romantic and non-romantic relationships? In my teens, I started pulling from masculine, nice gay culture to spend more time with women instead. This was rewarding, but when women complained about bad behavior for men, I developed intense, a sense of shame and guilt by association. Even if I wasn't doing those things, I eventually felt like a lighting right for all the resentment women have toward men and for misogyny in general. So instead of compensating by performing masculinity to hide my femininity, as many do, I think I began compensating for the larger problems of gender in society by becoming preoccupied with women's safety and well-being at the expense of my own. And I think I unconsciously felt that if I could help damaged women become whole again, it would alleviate the pain of not knowing how to bring the woman inside me out into the real world in order to become a whole person myself. Does this make sense to you? Yes, it does. Have you seen anything like this in your professional experience? If so, how can I unlearn this pattern and have healthier relationships going forward? I love having women in my life, but I just don't go, I just can't go through this again. So it looks like I thought it was more overcompensating um, in a different way, but uh, this is still obviously overcompensation. Um, so you're non-binary trans femme uh, in midlife and you're recovering from recent separation from seven-year marriage. I'm assuming this is a seven-year marriage you just described. And if it is not, and if this is relationship you're in, it does sound, at least from what you describe, uh, pretty it sounds like there's some elements of abusive uh, interactions there 
So I would really um, advise for you to look into that and to consider that. Now, it sounds like what you're saying is that you're overcompensated uh, by people who were maybe um, really um, too affected by toxic masculinity, uh, by becoming overprotector of women, and in doing so, you neglected yourself. This is very, very common. It is incredibly common for people to op overcompensate in numerous ways. Um, this is being one of them. Other ways people overcompensate is when people do everything for everybody else. Other ways people overcompensate is throwing themselves into the stereotypically gender activities based on their gender assigned at birth. All of those things are very, very common. And one of the reasons why a lot of you tend to overcompensate is because you're trying to find a way to cope with gender dysphoria and overcompensation gives you a sense of purpose. Once you have a sense of purpose, in your case, the sense of purpose was protecting women from misogyny, from toxic masculinity. That sense of purpose starts making you feel needed and it starts making you feel good about yourself because you're doing something that in your mind's eye is good and positive. And in doing so, you're taking away the spotlight from doing anything about yourself and your internal state. So that's where there's that overcompensation falls and it is very, very common. What my suggestion for you, my suggestion for you, if possible, to engage in individual therapy where you can uh, kind of uh, unhash those patterns of overcompensation so that you're consciously aware when they happen. So you also consciously aware when you seek uh, women as partners, whether you lean towards those women that you're trying to save. Also, to ask yourself, is it a time to stop overcompensating? And is it a time to learn the lens from uh, helping others towards helping yourself? Maybe this is the time for you to focus on yourself, to give yourself something you're never giving yourself. Maybe this is time to finally start to address the dysphoria that is looming within. Uh, that's what I would really encourage you to do. But this is very common. Uh, lots of people who are listening to this have compensated one way or another. Great question. Question number two, and this one is a long one too, so bear with me as I read it. Dear Dr. T, thank you for your work and efforts helping the transgender community. You're so welcome. My pleasure. Bear with me as I try to provide an introduction to my question. As a transgender woman, not only on hormones yet, I was looking for studies and data. If they existed at all, the gender identity was formed prior to birth due to exposure of specific hormones in the womb that at a certain stage of development. And I came across Dr. Joshua Saver. So uh, Joshua Saver is an endocrinologist, um, and as you point out, a director, executive director of the Mount Sinai Center of Transgender Medicine and Surgery in New York City, um, a fantastic person. He speaks about the shift in the medical field's understanding of the biological basis of gender dysphoria. He also expanded the view of the whole World Health Organization, which is relevant and states ICD-11 has redefined gender identity-related health, replacing outdated diagnostic criteria like ICD-10's transsexualism and gender identity disorder of children with gender incongruency of adolescence and adulthood and gender incongruency of childhood, respectively. Gender incongruency has been moved out of the mental and behavioral disorders chapter and into the new conditions related to sexual health chapter. This reflects current knowledge that trans related and gender diverse identity are not conditions of mental health, Ill, Ill health and that classifying them as such can cause enormous stigma. Yes, I agree, it does. And not only can, but it does cause enormous stigma. Um, I'm also not so sure if putting them under sexual health chapter is also not going to cause then additional stigma as well. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's an interesting field we're entering because uh, there's people who develop dysphoria uh, today by, it's a social dysphoria first before it's physical. Based on this, it looks like the WHO is help, helpful in providing clarity, leaving the mental side care to professionals like yourself. Um, to have individuals trying to understand their feelings and who they uh, they are without shame, guilt, or the additional requirements of proof in regard to gender identity. Other mental challenges by clients, patients could surface during the gender discovery phase, as I call it, and could require assistance or care. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Saver says the basic medical care, such as hormones, 
and gender related services, etc., are secured under the school definition and covered by basic health care insurances providers uh, and cannot be, oh, you missing the, I think, cannot be rejected as such on other grounds, politics, slash religions, etc. My question, do you support this biological basis of gender incongruency based on your experience knowledge? And if so, why is there so much resistance and noise? No, it's source. Okay, you're putting down source. Thank you for the source. So do I do I support the gender incongruency is based on uh is is uh based on biological basis? Yes. Would I support the gender incongruency solely lies on biological basis? Um, no, and I will tell you why. Because the more I understand and the more I work with gender diverse individuals, the more I realize that uh, gender dysphoria is not that simple. Now, there are people for whom gender dysphoria starts with biological basis, um, with that physical sense of incongruency and also um, some kind of maybe other biological linkages. But then there is also a lot of individuals we see today who uh, become aware and start feeling uh, gender dysphoria uh, that initially starts from feeling social dysphoria because of the way the world binary uh, Y sees gender. So a lot of those people would not necessarily fit in the safer idea um, of a biological basis. It would look uh, and more like a, a kind of whole social holistic model overall. I think that what tends to cause gender dysphoria, which I 100% agree with, with Dr. Safer, it is not a medical illness. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, it's not a mental health illness. The, the symptoms stemming from the incongruency are psychological in nature because it's a psychological distress that people feel. Um, but in of itself, this is not a mental health illness unless we're talking about uh, very incredibly, incredibly uh, small individuals who may be colluding uh, gender dysphoria with uh, some uh, episodes of maybe like a brief psychotic episode, it's incredibly small percentage, just to be very, very clear about it. Um, so for me, I believe that gender dysphoria is a psychological distress gender incongruency let's use that word let's use say your words gender incongruency uh is uh, multi-layered what causes gender incongruency for some people could be solely biological for a lot of people it could be some other elements a combination it could be biological and um I think gender identity uh, formation in human beings is much more complex and more nuanced I also believe that a lot of people have more um, fluid predispositions toward their gender identity, meaning their gender identity is not fixed throughout their lifetime, but is much more fluid, just like one sexuality might be fluid, not to equate gender with sexuality at all, but just to give you an example. So I, I agree with, I would say I agree with safer partially, but I wouldn't say that gender inc all of gender incongruency is first and foremost always biological. Um, yeah, biological is, um, I would say, yeah, because a lot of people don't have this biological basis. Um, why do I think that there is so much resistance and noise? Because there's, we don't have a foolproof research and people want, people who make a noise, they want foolproof uh, research, they want that 100%, 1000%, show me the study, show me the brain differences, show me how it is biological. How are you going to prove that it's biological? Um, if you're making it incongruency solely basing on the biological uh, basis, uh, then give us the proof, right? And people are going to go ahead and then argue that uh, we know that cancer is biological because we can demonstrate malignancy of a tumor. How are you going to demonstrate it? Show us. You know, pe people are like that. So um, unfortunately, this is why there's so much resistance. All in all, I think this is moving in a better direction. Uh, but um, I think part of the, I think in my opinion, it is important to start to acknowledge gender incongruency as also not something that pathological to begin with, period. Um, whether it's because it's from biological forces or numerous other forces, but to also realize that for some people, it could be that their identities, their sense of self, their whole uh, way of relating to themselves 
has just evolved into something else, naturally evolved something into something else. Um, and we have to also recognize that as well uh, versus constantly looking for a particular set of causes. But it's a really good question. Comment below what you think, what your thoughts are. Um, I know I know for a lot of trans people, they feel like it would be really helpful. Uh, a lot of trans people tell me, my God, I really wish there was a blood test I could go and take and just proof, proof that this really happened to be improved, that this is not just all taking place in my head. And uh, yeah, it's hard, there's no such blood test, but um, uh, I don't think it's all taken inside of your head. Trust me, I know your bodies are suffering a lot. Great question. Question number three. Hi, Dr. Z. I'm a trans woman out to my lovely wife and few of our closest friends. I haven't contacted the local trans community because I don't feel ready and also because I am a bit afraid. While I'm proud of who I am, I'm struggling to be proud of the trans label. I understand that the designation of trans woman is a very useful way to describe what I am, but who I am is a woman. If I could be a cis woman, I would. Is this a common problem? Any advice? Thanks for your amazing content. You're so welcome. Is this a common problem? I think that it's, it's. Um, I wouldn't call it the common problem. I think that a lot of uh, trans women have the same feelings. And I think a lot of trans women, and they have also shared this with me, they don't want to carry a trans label. And this is the open sage, just like you do. This is uh, not who I am. It might be what I am, but this is not who I am. I'm much more than that. And I agree with you. You are much more than that. Um, and I know that you're afraid. Um, you know, I want to say that those designations, you know, in my experience, the ways that I understand those designations, a cis woman, trans woman, to me, this is how I see it. I see a woman is as one big umbrella term. And underneath that umbrella term, there's these designations. And they're just there to, um, sometimes we need to be able to clarify certain um, anatomical differences. And saying that a person is a trans woman, it is clarifying an aspect of perhaps in could be just chromosomal anatomy. Um, saying that a person is cis woman is clarifying some other basis too. But to me, both cis and trans are a thousand percent women. Now, of course, people are going to run and argue that no look up definition of a woman a woman is biological female well definition is changing and uh, female is a sex designation um, and we know that uh, it changes so uh, I'm not talking about a female umbrella I'm not talking about XX chromosome umbrella I'm not talking about any other uh whatever we equate to sex the stays umbrella i'm talking about a woman which is a germ uh gender i'm sorry i can't speak towards the end of the day it's a gender term and a construct and underneath that construct there are trans women and cis women and who knows who may have other women with other designations underneath that umbrella so you're definitely more than just that and it's up to you how much of your transgender history you want to share with other people. It may be that you're already out to your friends and your wife, and that's great. You don't have to constantly out yourself to everybody else. Your transgender history is your personal history. You don't have to be a vocal advocate for it unless you want to, and there's no shame in that. I don't think that that in any way makes you less proud or less comfortable or less accepting of your experience of what you've been through. I've been through cancer. I don't tell people all the time that I'm a cancer survivor. And by not telling that I'm not a cancer survivor, it doesn't mean that I'm sh ashamed of having cancer experience or that I don't want to advocate for other cancer survivors. No, I just think my cancer history is mine and it's personal and I can choose. This is my boundaries. My personal boundaries is in selecting who I choose to share it with and I would recommend the same goes for you you don't have to be vocal about it you don't have to explain um and uh you are a thousand percent like I said a woman those all of those words that we use trans cis 
they're just there to clarify things. They're just there to do not things, um, you know. Like if you went to a gynecologist, right? If a trans woman goes to a gynecologist and a gynecologist uh, uh, does a uh, assessment and a gynecologist asks a trans woman, is there any chance that you can possibly get pregnant? In that case, a trans woman might say, you know, because I am transgender you or I'm a trans woman and using that precursor to a woman, you're basically clarifying or you're sharing some elements of your anatomy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it doesn't make you a less woman. Um, it just makes you a woman with different uh, possibilities, different capabilities. Um, and that's it. It doesn't rob you of anything less or it doesn't shorthand you, in my opinion, in any way. So my advice is decide for yourself. What do you think would be, um, what's your boundary lies with that? And um, I don't think you have to use a designation unless you want to. And I don't think you're going to be dishonest either if you just drop the trance altogether and just refer to yourself as a woman. You know, I I really don't think you are being dishonest at all. My opinion, for whatever it comes. Question number four. What's question number four? Yeah, question number four. Here's the question I'm struggling with at the moment. I know gender dysphoria is, is where the mind and body are incongruent, where your mind feels different to your physical body. However, I was assigned male at birth, and after 30 years, I'm comfortable in my male role, both mentally and physically. I feel like a man. Trying to call myself anything other than a man, a brother, a son, a father, it feels alien. Yet I still desire to transition. Is that still just for you or your experience? Could there be something else going on? Uh, first of all, it's impossible to say exactly because a lot of missing from this context. What I would encourage for anybody presenting with this case history to me where, you, like you say, you are comfortable with your male role, both mentally, physically, you feel like a man, um, you know, you're comfortable with those roles, then my question would be, are you also then comfortable with Apart from the role, are you comfortable with your gender expression as a man? Then my next question would be, are you comfortable with your physical aspects of masculinity? And are you comfortable when you get gendered based on the physical aspects of masculinity? And if you're going to say, yes, I'm comfortable with all of those, then my next question to you would be, what underlying you desire to transition? So what, what drives the desire for a lot of uh, uh, trans folks? What drives the desire to transition is the distress of dysphoria, the pain of dysphoria, um, the struggle of not feeling like they're one, not feeling like they're congruent with how they see their authentic gender. That's what drives uh, transition for a lot of people. So if you're not having any of that, then my question would be what drives your desire to transition do you just want to because you said trying to call you anything other than man brother and a son and a father feels alien then you still it's interesting you still desire to transition transition to what the transition how transition how far what are the goals transition means a lot of things so i would really dig deeper with all of this with you and try to to understand um where the desire is coming from or what is it telling you about yourself or what is it maybe there's an elements about your uh, identity to your gender that is still dormant that is still repressed maybe there's denial happening here um, that's what I would, I would explore all of that. And if you have access to a therapist, this is a great place to work on all of the things, um, to excavate and to dig a little bit deeper. And that's what I would recommend. Yeah, but I'm sorry, I can't, uh, just not enough information, uh, because, um, a lot of things could be going on here on table and, and it's, it's a questioning phase. This is what I do when I work with clients. I, um, it's my job to take a shower and to start digging because people are, don't know how to dig within themselves. And I help them dig to find more deeper meaning with all of the things may mean. And then when we find the deeper meaning, we then work and decide on what now we're going to do about the find now that we have this deeper meaning. Question number five. Hi, Dr. C. Thanks for answering my previous question from months ago. You're very welcome. I appreciated your detailed response and have been keeping up with your channel and really enjoyed hearing from other people's issues, even if relatively unrelated to my own. Anyway, here's my question. By the way, feel free to ask me if you ask me a question before. Feel free to send me a question again. There's no limit. I'm a 24-year-old trans woman who has been on hormones for a bit over a year. 
I'm out to friends and family, but do not really present femininely in public. This is because I still feel so uncomfortable with how my body and face are. As of right now, I have only been gendered female a few times offhandedly in public. For better or worse, my confidence is deeply tied in my own perception of how well I pass. So of now, my confidence is extremely low. However, due to the sheer lack and privilege, I have FFS in a few months with the top-notch surgeon. Congratulations. I'm extremely grateful and blessed to say the least. My self-proclaimed expert trans friends all say that will look amazing, fully passing, beautiful, etc. after I have the surgery. Furthermore, the FFS, uh, the surgeon did detail any hopes and dreams I could ever have regarding my, my appearance. Before all of that, I think it's virtual FFS, VFFS. You had a surgeon detail virtual FFS. What does it look like? Makes it you make it sound like you're going to facial team in Spain. They do virtual FFS assessments. My self-proclaimed expert trans friends will okay, sorry, I'm reading this already. Read this. Um before all of that, I was hard, it was hard for me to have any expectations, but now I have the opposite issue. I often fantasize about how life changed this may be for me, and it's hard to contain my excitement. I'm aware that having my now high expectations not met would be absolutely soul-crushing and devastating. Yes, I would agree with that. I am finding it challenging to consider that the reality won't be a perfection nor disaster. Even so, that seems to be a logical conclusion. Do you have any advice for managing my expectations in the situation? Oh my goodness, you dear you. I hope you get this answer in this Q&A not too late before your surgery. Um, Managing expectations is really important when it comes to surgery. And in my experience, facial feminization it tends to be a game changer for a lot, for pretty much everybody. It, it really does change things for a lot of people if passing is their goal. Now you're 24, so you're very young. Um, and you've been on hormones for a bit over a year. So you're still very young in the hormones, right? And even though you are... Um, do not present feminine in public you already been gendered as you know gendered based on your authentic gender in public already without even doing anything that tells me that most likely um most likely that tells me you already at 24 um but here on hormones i don't think it's the hormones necessarily doing all this per much but i think you initially probably already have some would perhaps adrenergist appearance, I would guess, because for people who get gendered um, uh, female without doing anything else really early into tradition, that's because there's an elements of femininity already present. So it sounds like you have a lot of things going for you. If passing is your concern, sounds like it is. And it sounds like um, you already, like you said, you have a surgery, not with just any surgeon, but a very skilled surgeon uh, in uh, the transgender facial feminization field. So what I encourage, if I was working with you, what I would encourage for you to do is instead of not presenting at all and putting all of your eggs in one basket, in this case, you one basket is going to be facial feminization. So instead of, or all of your eggs are going to be facial feminization. So instead of putting all of your facial feminization eggs into one basket, right? And then setting up this crazy expectations for yourself and driving yourself to a brink of anxiety before the surgery. And then after surgery, driving yourself insane by overanalyzing results. What I would, would have done and encouraged you to do is instead of fully presenting feminine, which I never tell people to do, but to start slowly mo moving the envelope. Uh, if you present masculine, start presenting more androgynously, and then as you present androgynously, let's see what happens. Chances are giving at least what I kind of deduced from what you shared, and I'm betting my money, you already kind of have a drunge presentation. Once you start presenting more drunge, so you probably will start getting gendered female even more. And then I would encourage you to introduce and push the envelope a little bit more. Now that you've done that, what other elements of signifiers can you start editing for yourself? So now we're going to move from adrenergist to adrenergist slash uh, feminine presentation, but not hyper feminine yet. And all of that with the goal to raise your confidence, to give you um, a sense of 
uh, starting to be able to see yourself, starting to be able to see that things are possible. And by that time, when you have surgery, you would feel that much more prepared. So that's what I would recommend. But at this point, if you get this and it's too late, um, manage your expectations. Just, you know, trust that you're in the hands of a really good doctor. Trust that you, everything is going to work out. And, you know, in this transition, a lot of it is what you put into it. And a lot of it is how you work on yourself too. But in my experience, special feminizations with top-notch doctors have always been game changers for anybody. And I uh, have a hard time picturing that it would not be the same for you. And I smell facial team spain uh here i don't know if i'm wrong i don't you know but um yeah that's what or i'd be curious who who, who is the surgeon maybe it's kill jump or or uh Deshaun Braley. um okay great question and i wish you all the best and you got this sounds like you have a great support system too so you got this and you're 24 years old I, so many people watching this are probably like you're 24 <laughs> How lucky are you and to have be able to get surgery with a top notch surgeon? Um, so right on that wave, you know, how beautiful is that? Question number six. Hello, Dr. Z. I'm a 54-year-old transgender woman, no partner, no kids, a more or less supporting family, and a great group of mostly cis women friends, colleagues that are a great help. That's awesome. Nothing like a circle of women to shepherd you through. Um, I guess a, a great sense of being of being close has defined my life from about three to 48 years old transition then took over from about 48 now from way further back and then actually but it was so gradual that it is better defined as coping from puberty to 48 then COVID gave me a giant kick in the booty to send me out of the closet COVID gave a lot of people a giant kick in the booty so not a lot of people feel that I have just undergone breast augmentation last week. The result is still very imperfect, but a lot of time is needed for the twins to settle. Her patience is hard. Bottom surgery is scheduled for October 18, and I eagerly await that day. But in the meantime, I feel that my implants have filled a giant hole in my life. Just 40 is not gone yet, and it will always stay lurking in the background because of some parts that are not fixable, but it has just drastically reduced. And now, well, I feel kind of lost. I'm not even sure I know myself outside of just 40 coping transition. I know I have to figure it out. I know the answer is within me somewhere deep. Expected freedom, not a, a, not a weird void. I've tried investigating this question, but so many trans stories, each with the actual transition, I would even dare to say surgery. And I feel that this moment would be different if I were younger. Your input would be much appreciated. Oh, I, I hear you, you know. Um, so I'm thinking about a lot of things. This is why I'm taking a pause. First of all, it is very, uh, very natural and normal uh, for some people, especially if you've been struggling with this 40 since early childhood for you, you said from three to 48, you've been struggling with this 40 for a long time and coping with it. Um, there's a big, can be a big kind of disconnection, disconnectivity to yourself. And then when you start transitioning, gender transition hormones and surgeries can start alleviating the distress you feel, but yet the void that you described can still be there because now you feel lost because you're like, okay, now I am who I always wanted to be, but yet I don't feel happy yet because you're not, it's almost as if you're now struggling to connect the externalization of yourself with the internal self so the idea the image that comes to mind to me is when people struggle with gender dysphoria and when they struggle with it from three to 48 like you described they start to be like robots they operate on autopilot they become a shell without a soul and substance within when people start to address this and this goes through gender transition and if they don't integrate and connect to their soul, they continue to be a shell without a soul within. But now the shell just taking on 
a physiological form that you always desired and wanted and the one that you identify with. So it is very important to connect the soul to the shell. Transition is not just about physical. It's not just about external. It is so much more about internal. It is so, so much more about internal. It's not just all external. It is not. It's so much this internal connectivity to the self. And this is what I'm hearing you talking about. Um, and this is why it may feel like a void. You know, you get the surgery, you get breast augmentation, and, and you still don't, don't really feel it. You don't feel like yourself. So what I would recommend, and you're right, like you said, the answer is within me, somewhere deep it is. How can you engage in emotionally focused therapy? I'm the worst therapist in this case is because I am very analytical. I'm really good at getting clarity for the clients I work with. I'm very good helping. Um, I'm like therapist slash coach when I work with people. I'm very motivational. I'm very fire. Think about like fire element. I, I, I help you connect with your will and your drive. I help you make decisions. Um, but you need somebody who is now the opposite. You need somebody who is like water. Somebody who is going to allow you and, and help you connect within and help you cultivate that femininity. Who is that woman? What does that woman want? What are her dreams? How does she envision her life? So you need to go deeper and start connecting to the essence of yourself. And through that, start cultivating a practice that is going to foster relationship between those aspects of yourself, okay? And that's challenging to do for all of us. It is so hard for so many of us to connect to a deeper inner part of ourselves, but it is very, very possible. If you can do therapy, there's a lot of books you can find. I would recommend for you even books on divine feminine, books on connecting to sacred feminine, books on connecting to your emotional uh, side. Look for those texts and books that a lot of times can even do guidance and give work uh, exercises and whatnot to help you sit deep within yourself. I often recommend for clients who are in your position to go on women's retreats and connect to other women in a different i know you're connected with a lot of women friends but to start connecting in the soulful heart chakra way uh, so there's definitely a lot of things you can do but um, this void you experience is a void of coping for so long and living uh kind of in a soulless way for so long uh in a shell and now just moving to another shell but still not connecting to your soul. And it's a painful void. And I apologize if you feel this way, uh, but you're not alone. A lot of people feel that void too. And sometimes people start questioning, was this the right thing? This is just not really fixing anything. That's because sometimes we put so much emphasis on external and we don't realize that it's a lot of it is internal work too. So I really hope you ponder what I suggested, what I advised, and uh, I wish you all the best. So that's it. That's six questions for today. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions. If you're watching this and you have a question uh, for me, feel free to email it info at drzphd.com. My uh, email is down below. Comment below, share what your thoughts are on some of the questions that have been asked, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.